back in this bitch, uh Know we full attack in this shit, uh You know the full Mac came equipped, uh So promise you don't want no Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the 8 More Than 92 Podcast, where we always keep it 100 with you. We're your host, Harrison. Najee. All right, we today are joined by a very, very dope brother. I met him after going to a comedy show, Josh and Friends. He is a very down-to-earth brother, another Nashville native with the Black Nashville Assembly. It was a great meetup. He's telling, uh, he's actually doing a lot for the national community. We're getting the community legislations for all of our black people there. We have Jamel here today with us. How are you doing today, brother? I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm happy to be here to be able to have such a like robust conversation about a place I love so much. Well, we do appreciate you coming on, and it's the dopest part about it is uh black people are doing stuff for our legislation and for the city of Nashville, doing something for us to have our voices heard and not just seeing and uh, just talking and coaxing us up and just patting us on the back. Uh, a lot of episodes that we have had, we were talking about it just not too long ago. We were saying when we saw uh, Biden just sign that bill, the I think it was the relief. What was it, Josh, that he just signed? The and it was like one point some billion. It was like to bring the people over and they get money and all that to take care of them. And then, you know, a lot of people was like, well, damn. Uh, I think who was that? Uh, uh, Quavo, Quavo. Somebody came out with just like, you know, they can do all this for people that's not even ours, but they can't do it for the black community. Yeah. So we got that. We got uh, we got the people trying to come over here for Ukraine. Just sign everything else but black legislation. They want to do lift every voice and sing. Uh, but so I thought this was very positive for the black Nashville assembly to make sure we are heard and, um, make sure things are being started and what better place to start that from our own homebred city. So Jamel, go ahead and just tell everybody about the black Nashville assembly and sure, it's so a mumble. <laughs> no, nah, it's all good. So first, my name is Jamel Kamaguch. I'm from Nashville. All my people have been from Nashville. We have been here since uh, 1794. So if you, if you know anything about history, you know what I'm saying? So we have been here since Tennessee was a North Carolina territory. But if you look at my family's material, this, well, if y'all look at my family's material wealth and the material wealth of the people who got here at the same time at my family, and we know them, they have streets named after them, the Overtons, the Briley's, um, you name the Belmonts, right? My family don't have anything. And so really, when, when we talk about these things, even when we talk about politics, I'm really doing it from a place of like ancestral lineage to the land. And I think that's important to like queue up, right? Really coming in the honor of all my ancestors. So the Black Nashville Assembly uh, was created out of the uh, energy of the George Floyd uprisings. During the uprisings, me and the homie uh, Mike Floss, Erica Perry, who are also some locals here, we were going to protest in the streets, like probably a lot of the people listening here. And what we realized is like black folks have been mobilized, right? We are often like mobilized to vote, uh, mobilized to do these different things, so supports to certain candidates. Um, but we hadn't been organized around the demand, right? Like, what do we want? Because every single time we ask for certain things, they don't give us what we want. They actually just give us what is politically savvy for them to get. So out of that was born the Black National Assembly, where we are coming together, uh, Black folks, to talk about what do we want and to build out a Black political agenda that services the needs of Black folks in Nashville. And when we talk about bringing folks together, we're talking about bringing back to black folks together from all walks of life right you can be local you can be in nashville um all you gotta have the only prerequisite is just like the love for black folks and since then we've been hosting like assemblies where we make our political decisions we've been hosting uh mass meetings where we do our political engagement um uh, we know that nashville right now has a judicial election coming up so we've been having like political engagement and political education around what do judges do right and how do they affect our lives and what does it look like to hold a judge accountable when we know that the courts were literally built to house and harm black folks? Right. Um, and we often even say this uh, at the Black Nashville Assembly. We know that representation don't equal power. Right. We can have a whole lot of black representatives, but that don't essentially mean that we have collective power as a community. So how do we get collective power and stop relying on these one off faces? to like actually come and do anything into our community. So that's really the Black Nashville Assembly in a sense nutshell. And do you guys, uh, and I know, um, do you guys attach, I know it's political, do you guys attach yourself to a particular party at all? No, right, like the only thing, the only prerequisite is that you black, 
You know what I'm yeah, saying? Because we know we know black black folks fall on a political spectrum, but we all know one thing that there's that we can all attest to that there is an issue that the only way we can solve those is by coming together. Hey, so I was gonna ask you. So, like, just think about Nashville. You know, we all from Nashville and stuff. What, like, as of right now, you know, twenty twenty two. What do you feel like is the biggest issue or the, or the main thing that you guys are dealing with right now? Like, what, what, like, what are y'all trying to fix right now? For sure. So, uh, we do all of our meetings are black autonomous spaces, and the reason why is because we know that there's a specific way black people need to be able to talk to black people to be able to build our strategy and solutions to our issues, right? Because we know when non-Black people often come into a space, they they largely sometimes take up a lot of space, which we don't have time to be trying to, you know, that the issues are urgent. So we need to be able to have like a real, real conversation with each other because it's real harm happening. And we can offer up real solutions that, tailor, that are tailor-made for Black folks. Um, so when we first started the Black National Assembly, we got Black folks together and we asked that question, right? What are the top three things affecting black folks in Nashville. And we let black people who were participating in the assemblies come up with those things. And the three things they came up with was housing, education, and public safety. And public safety is a catch-all for courts, cages, uh, and police, right? And the thing was, was it's like, if we can cause change in any of those three areas, we know that those things are going to improve the lives of uh, black folks in Nashville. Yeah. So since y'all, so you said since George Floyd, so y'all been going on probably roughly like almost two years now. Uh, what do you feel like y'all have changed so far? You know, if you got people out there listening, it's like, hey, you know, like I know we got things that we're trying to change, but these are the things that we have. Did. For, for sure. And I appreciate that question um, because this is definitely like we are in a long term struggle right because we know we can't solve everything today but we are talking about solving things in our lifetime i do want to say that um if you look at uh and i'm gonna get hyper local here because it's the black nashville assembly if you look at the way um our elected officials are talking about safety right before um the george floyd uprisings and before the black nashville assemblies a lot of our elected officials even our black folks were talking about safety as in police um and in as in jails right but now what is starting to enter the lexicon is that public safety actually means good paying jobs, good housing, a good environment, um, a fully funded education. So ever since building out this context, we've been able, we've been able to like win campaigns where teachers got raises. Right. We've been actually able to like start having a diverse conversation around how community investment is actually public safety. So things like um, the mayor had a although this was trash the mayor had like a one million dollar participatory budgeting thing that well two million dollar participatory budgeting thing that happened in north nashville that was all because of our work um and us bringing to light the problems with the local budget um and the way that our local dollars are being allocated to police to actually solve like housing Right. Because black folks have always asked. We've always said we wanted safe communities. We've always said that every single black. We said that from every movement. But the system always, always takes that as saying you want police. Well, we actually know uh, fully funded education, access to food, good housing. We know that those other things, a well-resourced community makes our community safe. So we've not only been able to change the political orientation of how the elected officials are talking about it, but we've also had driven campaigns like getting our teachers raises, um, the participatory budgeting process. We have made those material changes happen along the way. But we know the big thing is, is to actually solve these large structural problems that are just violent towards black folks. About them, probably white folks kind of make trying to target you guys as a radical group yeah so i think like i think one thing we're gonna have to struggle through as a community is why when black folks come together to start talking about our issues and how we can solve them how we automatically is labeled as something that isn't productive right uh but when it's but when it's time they'll blame us for our own issues you see what i'm saying like they'll blame us for our own issues but then we come together and try to solve them they try to destroy it in some sort of way also uh, when we talk about radical we definitely want to be radical in the sense of getting to the to, to the root of the problem. I think Ella Baker talks about that in one of her books where she literally says being radical is making sure that we're talking about 
the actual problem that's existing. Um, so one thing that we can't do, though, is we can't be fearful of what's coming. Right. Because I think also a lot of the times the system um, uses that fear and intimidation to prevent us from actually coming together to get the thing that we know will improve our lives, which is political power. And when I'm talking about political power, I'm also talking about being, being able to literally walk outside, see your environment, want something to be changed and having the power to change it. Right. So if you walk into a classroom uh, of 30 students, 30 people, there's 30 students in the classroom, one teacher, and they only got 15 books. We should have the power to be able to be like, OK, let's get that. We can get 15 more books. Right. We need to go talk to somebody about that. And that change literally in real time. And I'm not talking about putting our money together to go do that, because often we have to do that. But I'm talking about literally using our taxpayer dollars to start getting the resources that we know our community needs. So I think like one thing we can plan for that type of deal. But we also know that the system uses that fear and intimidation from stopping us from even having these type of conversations in this open forum so that we can actually start talking about, OK, this is a problem and this is a solution that us three can be starting to do together to actually solve these issues. I got it. So I, I got a, uh, I mean, just a random question. Uh, is there anybody out there like that's going against you guys, like any anti groups that's like directly against y'all? Like, cause I seen, I, you know, I was going through y'all social media and, you know, looking at you guys and I see a lot of times y'all wear the same thing. So when y'all show up to places, people be like, Oh God, here they come. Or, you know, you got another group that's also at the same places that y'all at and they just going against you guys. Like, do y'all have any, uh, any rivals or anything like that? Yeah, I think we've already kind of talked. I mean, and I'm down with any question, by the way. I love like the most difficult questions you come up with. But it's like we've already talked about we've already started queuing up the backlash that usually comes when black folks start talking about our issues and coming together and trying to seize political power, which is the power that they try to stop us from seizing. Right. Everything uh, is like trying to distract us from doing that. When I'm talking about political, I just want to say this again. I'm talking about more than electoral politics. Right. That's one form of political power. I'm talking about the whole thing. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's no group out there that is just like directly contesting us. I will say in Nashville, when we start talking about um, a real fact, like right, like let's talk about the budget. Last year um, and every year, um, police pretty much our, their budget grows. No matter what, Metro Nashville Police Department budget grows, whether they're doing a bad job, a good job, whether some of them need to be fired, it's always going to go up. But if you even take a step further out in the last 10 years, we've invested over two billion dollars in police over the last 10 years. And at the same time, we've only invested less than 50 million in housing. So when when we start queuing that up, when we start talking about those type of dollars, it's no wonder that we're going through a housing crisis right now because look at how our city budgets have played out. And so a lot of the times when we start talking that truth and, and pulling back that curtain and lifting that veil with our people, we know that the people who benefit off of our streets being violent, off of an over an over invested in police force, an over relied on jail, we know the people and the private corporations who actually benefit from that start organizing behind closed doors. If I give you one example, um, um, the license plate readers that, oh, that boy, yeah, oh, that's, that's a good example of like what happens, right? We got, we talked about the license plate readers. This is not anything new. They've been having license plate readers across the country for 15 plus years. Well, give, um, give, so, before you keep going, give us a short summary of what, is the effects of license plate readers or what or what does it do so people people that don't know for sure so a license plate reader is a camera that is either on a on a on a police car or stationary that takes photos of license plates after they pass now i know a lot of folks can probably just assume what type of harm that can happen when that is uh going on so what happens is um, a police officer can put a hot list in or like a list of uh, vehicles. Let's say we looking for a vehicle that's a 92 uh, Ford Explorer and we got one letter on the license plate. The camera will take a photo of every single vehicle that matches that description and automatically run the license plate up against that vehicle and start tracking it down. Yeah. 
And a lot of people don't get why that's a lot of people may not get outside of Nashville may not get why that's crazy because in VA, well, that's where I'm at right now. VA pays tolls. So it's it's license plate readers all around here. So you know you expect that because you know they got front plates and back plate readers, but in Nashville, we don't got that. So when I left Nashville, I'm like, what is what why the hell is they taking pictures of my plates? So you know, and which which affects us now is you know, that's for the inner city. You know, it's a lot of people that live in the inner city. And so, you know, that's like you were saying, it's targeted for the inner city and who just happens to be working or in the inner city. Black people. Who are the police going after? Black people. So go ahead. Arizona also, they have the readers when you're going on the interstate. If you're going past a certain speed limit, it'll just take your shit. You know what I'm saying? They they send you tickets to hell and shit like that. So yeah, yeah, we wanted to highlight why we wanted to highlight why it's important for people of Tennessee who we don't have toll, we don't pay tolls in Nashville. So it's only one reason why you will be yeah. reading our play. It's, it's going to yeah. highlight. It's going to it's going to be pushing because everybody in Nashville don't work in Cool Springs or they don't work in the, they work in they work down to where they work in the city where those cameras are going to be pressed and where they're going to be they're going to be coming to where those cameras are. Yeah, right and and like we already know that once you automate something like that then tickets fines we already know who's going to be paying them the most um but even for people that are not familiar with it uh usually when i'm out talking to folks about the license plate readers although it might be an, an idea that they that they really can't grasp sometimes or hard but they do not trust metro nashville police department right because of the user of the license plate reader bill not too long ago we delivered a poor report and one of the things that the report literally said is that between 2012 and 2016 metro nashville police department poured over more black people in davidson county that lived in davidson county at the time right so we know that once we give a police force this type of tool that it's going to automatically be used to start harming black folks. And even down to um, across the country, they have an issue with these license plate readers also being used to like really harm undocumented folks. ICE uses these license plate readers across the country, which I will say also when it comes to those folks, it is the black folks who are immigrants that are also harmed the most in that situation. Right. Because we have a lot of immigrants that are black that look like us. Who are going to be harmed with those license plate readers and so in nashville um people the people are usually like yo we don't want those things just straight out for a whole list of reasons and also we had like 15 organizations in nashville anybody who does work the uh naacp black nashville assembly if you name the organization in nashville it came out against license plate readers but we still had elected officials that voted to pass it. So we know that like while we're doing the organizing on this end, the people who actually benefit like uh, Flock Solutions, who do, who uh, builds out license plate readers, Vigilant, who does the data software. We know that their corporations are also behind closed doors lobbying elected officials to get it done. So that is the type of thing that we're trying to organize to prevent from that happening over and over again, because we know that those things are what has Nashville locked in a cycle of harm. So, so I did one. Oh, go ahead, Josh. No, I was going to say so, so for just, you know, normal people that don't really know what to do, like what, what can the people in Nashville do to make change? You know, what can they do to, to kind of get more educated, to educate themselves or, you know, where can they go? For sure. So you can always join the black Nashville assembly. Uh, if you black, uh, we have we have monthly meetings. We have mass meetings. We have uh, we have a candidate forum actually coming up on April 2nd that we're going to try to include every single candidate possible. Um, and we're going to allow people to ask judicial and the district attorney candidates questions. Other than that, for my folks who are not in Nashville, the only thing we can do is we can organize. Right. We can talk to and when I say organize, I'm talking about being a member of organization. We can talk to our folks about what are our problems build a shared analysis and then build out a solution and then attack it from that direction right because we know like when we talk about something as big and structurally violent as housing we know that that's not it's not going to be enough if just one of us gets a house right it's going to be actually better if we can collectively start getting attached to the land 
but we're going to have to organize in order to shift power so we can actually get that done. So I did want to ask, so I know you guys said you weren't attached to a political party, but I mean, you know, you just kind of saw Marsha Washburn um, uh, go at the new black Supreme Justice nominee. And I want to say it's Kenji. I don't want to mess up her name, so I'm not going to say it. But uh, you kind of know the Republican Party don't really at the moment don't really have our best interest uh, when it comes to um laws and legislations you know you can look at uh um is it what is it mitch um mitch mcconnell mitch mcconnell uh so is it at the moment do you kind of feel like you would be more aligned to the democrats to kind of get things in line to what you would want for black uh laws and stuff to be passed at the moment i i, I mean i really think we're in a space where if i asked you a question how do we know what we want Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying has there been a platform that has allowed us to because i'm i mean we're having this open dialogue right now but i'm pretty sure if some of us was in a room together what's going to come out of our mouths is going to be something very raw right mm -hmm. um that because we because we're all close to these issues our, our folks i mean i got folks that um, died in prison you know what i'm saying yeah. um and so i think like before we even talk about which party we want to align with or get closer to I think we it serves us better if we can come up collectively with our own demands like what are black folks in nashville what do we want right yeah. and then we take what we want to certain people and then if they can't get it done we know we need somebody else there right because we need to have the ability to identify at this point who's serving our demands and who's not right we have a lot of black representatives we have a whole lot of black representatives right Mm -hmm. but we know representation don't necessarily equal power because some of those representatives have either been chosen for us or are not accountable to us because we can't get to them mm -hmm. right so i think before we even start talking about which party we align with whether it's republican democrat green party any of those parties it's all about who gonna give us our needs and who's going to give us what we are demanding so that we can actually improve the material condition of our lives now and for generations moving forward. How do I know that y'all are really taking care of us and our needs or y'all just not somebody that's in a political wire giving us promise? Like what makes y'all different from any other organization? Like do y'all go out in communities and do other things? Like how do y'all make yourselves personable to the community other than just trying to get laws? Like what makes y'all different? Like do y'all go out and I know, I, like I said, I've, been on the calls and i've seen that seems like are y'all actually ingratiating yourselves in the community like are y'all going to people like are y'all out in the communities or other than just passing laws like how much involvement are y'all with the communities that y'all are out here passing laws for so the black nashville assembly is a base building organization we looking for everyday black folks right we want to be able to get in them streets knock them doors and literally invite black folks out right so we go to events wherever black people are gathering we try to send our organizers in so that we can talk to black folks so they can attend the next mass meeting they can attend the assembly because we know like we need to be able to get to a third of black folks in nashville that's a big number right so we ain't really made no waves until you don't talk to ten thousand black folks you don't you i mean i don't even want to really hear what you think black folks need until you talk to 10,000 black folks, right? Mm -hmm. So we're a base building organization. And so what we do is we bring folks in and we have these conversations and we determine what our solutions are through those conversations. So this is not, this is not like a hierarchical organization. This is mm -hmm. not built around one singular individual, but this is a collective of people that are perpetually base building. You know, at the mm -hmm. last assembly, my mama, my cousins, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, I think it was Mike's pops that was uh playing on the saxophone, right? You see what I'm saying? So we involve in our family at every single at every single turn and every single bit. And we want to make sure like we have a strong base of black people that are organized around the demands that they created in order to actually shift power in Nashville. So that I think that's what makes us different from a lot of organizations that are out here. There are no there are really few organizations that are in the barbershops doing recruitment and then no matter what your political affiliation is if you have love for black folks you have a seat here and we're going to figure out where we align at and we're going to jam out on where we align and we're not going to really we're going to work on where we disagree but where we align is going to be the most important piece of this whole thing 
Um, and I think that's what really makes us different from any other organization that that is happening in Nashville or in Tennessee, rather. Do you think uh, some of this? Ha- do you think some of this has to do with the fact that Nashville is starting to boom, and you see a lot of the changes changes being made for the people that are coming that aren't from Nashville being dealt with and being changed before the people that are from being Nashville being handled first. Like for sure. I Go ahead. No, but for, cause I was going to say for sure. And, and I know y'all probably see this Nashville is forever changing. Mm-hmm. Um, also the historical relevance of Nashville is like extremely important throughout, uh, throughout the sixties, we had the student nonviolent coordinating committee, right? Which is the light is very readily shined on them, but whenever you're looking at a picture of, of Martin Luther King, uh, whether you agree with his politic or not, whenever you're looking at photos of him in marches or in meetings, usually two or three of the other black folks around him are attached to Nashville. So we know that when we solve issues in Nashville, that we can actually lead to a credible change and material condition change for black folks across the city. And I'm just, and I'm, and I'm not, and I'm biased here, right? Because all of my folks are in Nashville, and all my my whole entire family's here. So I'm like, if we can solve it in Nashville, we can solve it anywhere else, right? You see what I'm saying? It, it ain't nothing changed with the uh, zip code. Come on, you know so what I'm saying? I, yeah. so I, I want to ask you though. Uh, like, do y'all got somebody that keep all of y'all stats and everything? Like, if, if you said, who do you feel like, what age group do y'all, do y'all reach out to everybody? Do you feel like y'all are kind of younger generation or 30 and below? Or do y'all got like some 40s and 50s? You know, like, who are you guys reaching? Well, like, like at the last assembly, we had, uh, I know we had Mike's, Mike's pops playing his horn. Um, my mama was at the door, you know, being a greeter, welcoming security. We had a little bit of everybody there. We had young people opening us up. We had older folks. Now we do have around between, I think the majority of our members are around uh, 20 to 40. But we have that older, more democratically established black folks rolling through too, because it's like we have space for everyone because all of these systems are attacking us right we got folks that are in jail everybody has been touched by the jail system i don't know any black folks that don't know nobody in jail you know what i'm saying but if you go out here and talk to these non-black folks they got some of them don't even know people in right and that's an issue and so um we get a little bit of everybody from uh, we got this saying with the assembly we're looking for people who vote don't vote and have nothing to vote for because we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to be engaged in this way and actually have an opportunity to influence demands that we then get met by mobilizing and organizing around those demands and pressuring the people that need to be pressured to get the job done. We're, we're, we're anywhere black folks are, right? So we we often, we also use, uh, we also have like creatives um, that are a part of our organization that use their skills to, um, make the movement irresistible is what we say the role of the creative in the movement is to make it irresistible so homies like mike floss uh homies like organized uh lee who has a art show in the frisch show in the frisch art museum right now um and down to homies like chuck indigo um josh black they all kind of use their craft to uh help put some energy around building out this bold black political agenda that's going to be held down by black folks in nashville yeah, y'all can kind of call yourselves the the new Nashville Renaissance, right? That's that's them been thrown around by the creators. They don't deem themselves that. I was I, I think when I seen y'all, like I think when we were talking, it was just kind of like when we were talking about how Jefferson changed. And that was kind of like when when I was just saying a couple of minutes ago, um, it seems like all we did was want to change the MLS and change all of downtown and make that uh second avenue and everything different. But it's like they wanted to change. It's like what I was saying earlier. They wanted to give the war relief bill, everything else, but they didn't want to give, they didn't want to change no bills about black folks and police. They wanted to do everything else but but help us. They even want to help the gas relief bill, but they don't want to help us. And it's the same with Nashville people. You know, they wanna they wanna legislate everything, uh, but they don't want to help us first. And I feel like, you know, the black national assembly is our voice to say, hey. I grew up here. I graduated in 08. I graduated from Oakland. I graduated from Hillsborough. I graduated from Antioch. I graduated from Clint Club. And I went to TSU. I went to Fisk. I went to MTSU. I went to wherever I went. You know, I hooped 
in all these different places. And I grew up on Joe Johnson. I grew up, I went out to Lishy. I went out to all these places and our shit is not being taken care of, but you know, y'all are taking care of all these other things in order to bring the draft here or do all this other bullshit. And you, but y'all want to target us, but you want to make sure everything else good. You know, like I said, Marshall Washburn over asking dumbass questions. Oh, you out here suspending my man for 16 days for fighting for black people. Make it make sense. So sure. I I appreciate the black renaissance that y'all people that y'all are, y'all people <laughs> look at me that that my people are out here representing the Nashville that we grew up on as it turns to something else you know yeah and just because y'all give us an African American museum we are the city so um that is you know more what it is do you see what do you see what do you hope to see it in in five years yeah so I think something that you just mentioned i think you said this what i think was beautiful it's like we are the city right everything that the city everything that nashville is known for whether it was the music city which which was because of the works of the jubilee singers um hot chicken which my homies know how to fry all the time right with places like prince princess hot chicken and stuff like that we really define what the culture of nashville is we do right but if you look at it, we're constantly being displaced over and over and over again. And what I enjoy about the creatives that we work with um, that are that are bringing on the Black Renaissance, which I think was, I think Mike Ewan was the first person that I heard uh, who's a museum curator who graduated from Fish. He was the first person I heard say that. Um, we are really excited because our, our creatives actually bring the culture to the space, right? So during our assemblies or our mass meetings, we often have performance performances. We have singers. I think Sunil came and sung at the last one. Um, Josh has done comedy at them, right? And so, because we know, like, when we include culture, is it allows us to also express um, our needs in a new and innovative way. And I appreciate our creatives because they're not just giving the sauce away for free. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I think in the next five years, I think uh, a great place that Black Nashvillians could be in is one, like we could be getting our demands met around public schools, around having fully funded schools. Um, a lot of black folks in Nashville are uh, support staff in schools. And if you know uh, anything about Nashville and uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools, the support staffs are not Metro employees. Mm-hmm. And that creates a problem because they don't get the benefits of Metro employees. So yeah. something like our support staff getting raises, being Metro employees. And then also, People who have been displaced because it's expensive to live up in Nashville right now. People, who, right? So people who have been displaced, if they have an opportunity to at least come back, I think that's a beautiful thing. And thirdly, something like a guaranteed basic income, right? Because we know like certain things can't be legislative out, and at some point, we just need a cash infusion. If you look at our local dollars right now, um, the American Rescue Plan dollars sent unrestricted cash funds to cities across the country in nashville we have about 255 million dollars that could just be used for anything so what would it look like to put black folks who are struggling to live in davidson county on a guaranteed basic income to make up for the wage gap um that we are experiencing here so innovative new things like that versus just constantly putting money into police and jails (laughs) <laughs> to to make our community safe when they don't do nothing but end up harming us more. So yeah. I, so I was gonna ask, uh, you know, what me and James being military and we understand like all the things that we have to do and we got other jobs and we got the podcast. Like, how do y'all? Because I know you guys, this is not your only life, you know. So I know all you guys probably got regular jobs because you're not really, you know, getting paid and stuff like that from doing this. So how do you? How do you you guys time manage? to kind of figure out, hey, how are we going to do this? And, oh, I got to go to work. Hey, I got to do this and I, and I got to do these things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what you just said, that's a struggle. You know what I'm saying? Trying to, We are a base building organization, so we do have people that we train up that help us with these things. We always get volunteers to do outreach with us, canvassing, knocked on doors. We recently did a, a – we recently went over in Napier and knocked on a whole bunch of doors – uh, which was a very interesting because you know when black folks get together, it started getting real. Like, who who your mom? Who your mom again? You related hey, to? Uh, hey, nigga, mom? that's that's such and such son. Yeah, <laughs> and then you know when it started getting like that into a place that's like highly compacted, like like a uh, JC Napier, like everybody started wanting to come out, and then like a 
really when you start and this is why i love being an organizer when you start asking black folks like you know hey what's the issue around here they know them they rattle them off like yo you know they over here tripping you know we need to do this and and i love with the black nashville assembly that's an opportunity to take that information that we all inherently know about our environment outside and like also transform it into like okay how we gonna trans how we gonna take care of that you know what i'm saying and at the same time take care of it in a way where it don't happen again um and so we use volunteers a lot none of us are paid staff right now uh but we are hoping that we uh are able to fundraise enough to get a paid staff person because our membership is growing black folks when they start hearing about like the black nashville assembly and that we're coming together to talk about our issues it's a black autonomous space you can be free here you can say what you need to be said but also be opening to like struggling with black folks who may not hold the same values of black folks want to come to that you know what i'm saying so we're at a point now where we're doing uh f- where we fundraising to try to get more dollars uh we recently and we're launching um what we call the southern movement committee which is 501c3 um and so we're hoping to build out because as black folks start telling us yo we want these programs we want to be able to find grants donations and stuff like that to do the programs to actually solve the problems while we're working on that legislation and that policy solution as well uh do you guys have like because I know you guys got a plan and everything that's going on, but do you are y'all starting at certain communities? Let's say, like you said, y'all starting in the Napier community first, and then y'all gonna go out South Nashville, then y'all gonna go out East Nashville, and then you know, do y'all have like a, a kind of like a plan of where y'all gonna start in Nashville, and then kind of grow from there, and then just kind of reach all of the different sides? Yeah. So I mean, I'm from North Nashville. My family, all my family's from North Nashville. So I think one thing that we always start with is like, who are your people? Right. It's what we ask each other, because then you know who you should be organizing. Right. So. Um, usually, I think what, what we're planning on doing is since we are a base building organization, people are coming with their networks. So usually what we tell folks to do is, hey, yo, invite your family, invite your folks. You know, a lot of our folks, me and Erica went to East uh, East Literature High. And so a lot of our folks are in East Lit alums. Right. Because those are our people. Those are our folks that we're bringing. So we're really hoping to like keep hitting sides of towns, but also activate the memberships networks because Nashville, um, and this, I don't I think this is gonna how it's gonna be for a while. The black folks in Nashville are like one or two black folks away from knowing each other. You know what I'm saying? When usually you get two or three black folks in a room from Nashville, they get to talking. Somebody either related to somebody, or somebody knows somebody, somebody's man's. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we're really hoping to use those type of networks. To just keep drawing more and more black folks to the assembly structure that so whatever's born out of the assembly everybody had a piece of ownership in so therefore everybody can organize around that demand in that program you probably see yourself maybe stepping into teaching this in a course or one else maybe like afterwards or pushing it out there to pay it forward to somebody else or putting it out there that way I know you maybe not maybe don't see yourself as a teacher role, but getting it in an educational course, like have somebody teaching out to where the message can go on so it doesn't die. But I feel like these type of things need to be taught. You know, like certain things I feel like we age out of, like certain social studies or certain courses I feel like we age out of, but some of this shit that is going to be progressive because not everybody leads the bill, you know? Right. So certain things that are going to be conducive to them, if they stay there, need they need to know what it's going to be involved in their lives that is going to be uh, productive to them you feel like you know this might be uh something that we need to know absolutely like we down to do like any sort of the and i'm speaking as just like a black national assembly member like we down to do like trainings if folks listen to this is like yo i like that idea i want to do something like that in my neighborhood around some black folks feel free to reach out to us at blacknashvilleassembly.org or you can follow us on BLK NSH Assembly on any platform and reach out to us because what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to continuously use this model, go from middle Tennessee to Tennessee. And so hopefully that we can keep bringing folks along and it's to this political engagement because for so long, like even when we start using the word politics, a lot of our folks, and, and I think this is intentional, puts it and brackets it into voting. And we know a lot of our folks don't vote or just literally just 
don't want to even fool with that process. When we start engaging and talk about politics is actually everything around us. When we walk outside and we see trash everywhere, that's a policy failure. When it's hard to find housing in your neighborhood that is affordable, that's a policy failure. When you live in a food desert, that's a policy failure. That is School's an intentional on. decision by somebody. School zone. That, you know what I'm saying? All of that, right? And so, like, you don't have to be able to vote in order to change that. But what we do have to be able to do is apply pressure, be able to identify, okay, it's a city council person who did this. It's an alderman who did this. It's a state representative who did this. Apply pressure. Find out where they live. Pull up to their house. Where they go to church, all of that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you beat me to like two of my questions. Like that's the second one I was gonna ask you if you was gonna tap into the other boroughs. But you know, I think it's really dope. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know is notice, um, but you know, you you know, you write your own origin story. I know it's not really I, I I've asked myself this question, you know, because uh um, you know, doing the podcast, I, I don't I'm not Shannon, I'm not Kevin, I'm not anybody like, you know, I don't I don't have a blueprint to this. You know, I'm just doing it and I've gotten lucky enough to be semi successful mm -hmm. for a small market. And, you know, you've been successful with this and there's no blueprint to this, but you're writing your own story, your own origin story to this. And, you know, you've gone away without having a plan. And I give you kudos. I think it's very amazing, you know, and I, you know, give you a what is it at? Round of applause, though. You know, and I, I'm I'm very impressed. You know, like one of the best parts of coming to that show was meeting you and Mike and sharing them drinks with you and Josh because I'm glad for the relationships with bonding and being able to push this on to everybody. Because you know, one of my goals, I'm I'm out of Nashville, but I want to let everybody know where the fuck I'm from. And if anything, I can do is to put Nashville on. I want everybody to know in 50 states. Everybody gonna know me. And know what my city can do and if i can you know uh put this this platform black national assembly on at 50 states from what we do that's you know one of my goals is to make sure i can push y'all out you know that's like you, you see i'm a retweeting re reposting master you know what i'm saying so you know i want i wasn't lying to you when i met you i said anything i could do to help you know i would do that so you know i'm i'm glad to help oh also let everybody know about the elections and stuff in may uh, the district attorney elections that we have in um the april may yeah for, so, for sure so first i'm gonna start here because this is usually what people like are like floored by in nashville probably in a lot of places of listeners who are not in nashville in nashville our local judges are elected for eight year terms so it's very important that we are at least looking these people in the eye and seeing what they about. And we get people all the time, even on our mass meeting calls, people are like, yo, the courts ain't gonna get us free, right? They are literally doing what they were created to do, which is house and break up black families, yes. right? But we also know that the judges have a lot of power over us when they get elected. So what we're doing is we're holding a forum in April, on April 2nd, to get all the judicial candidates in one place, at least the ones who will show up, and like literally have a form and start thinking about and um, building out what it would look like to hold a judge who's going to be elected for an eight-year term accountable to us, right? And at the same time, struggle with the fact that no matter what we do, judges are going to harm us, no matter what they look like because that is literally what they were created to do um and we that's what we kind of struggled through and went through uh during the mass meeting and we're really i think we're really prepared for our candidate uh form and just to figure out like what we're going to do in the candidate form like i said before it's for people who vote don't vote can't vote and have nothing to vote for so even if folks are disenfranchised because they've been in prison or they've had legal trouble so they really can't vote this is still an opportunity for them to engage in a process where they can literally put their eyes on somebody and have a like an open dialogue whatever that's worth and josh check this out guess how many guess the maximum number of times he could uh serve as a, a judge yes let's take a guess uh i would say five full life I learned that the first one I was at. Full life. Full life. life. Eight years, full life. So full life. um, 
I definitely uh I wanted to ask you, did you mind um using our platform to talk to people outside of Nashville just to spread it anytime that you want to come? I, I can definitely I don't I don't want to like put you on like a specific, but any anytime I could reach out, like I see if you want to let people know whether it's a short five, ten, whatever. Hey guys, we doing this. Uh, no, absolutely. Anything like anything that you think would be viable to get into the hearts and mind of black people to pull into this struggle feel free you know what i'm saying and i okay. and i also want to say i know a lot of people even listen to this are from nashville and have been displaced from nashville and you still have a political home with the black nashville assembly even if you don't live here anymore because your networks are still here and it's those networks that are able to shift power in an area so much so that you might even have an opportunity to come back home or when you visit black folks are still here um and so like that invitation is always open and for right, you right. Memphis niggas, you know, you not on one niggas that we don't claim y'all all the time, but for this one, you are black. And we did not we did not fuck with y'all at TSU all the time, especially on the basketball court. But we're we're talking to y'all. Oh, Austin P, we didn't fuck with y'all. Or you lame niggas. We did not fuck with y'all, but we will claim you for this one. But you know, this lab, Josh, did you have something to say? Yeah, I had a few, I had, I had like two more questions. I, so I was gonna ask you, like, uh, I know you guys are getting a lot of uh, political party together that y'all can uh, speak to, but have y'all ever talked to a judge? Like, have y'all talked to any judges and like, have they given you any feedback? Like any any kind of thing that was viable where they was just like, ah, well, you know, we try to do this or, you know, like, cause sometimes you meet those people and they just be 100 with you and just be like, hey, look man this is what it is this is what we're trying to do i get it you know uh and then the other question you know just a uh, two parts so you can answer both is uh i would say like have y'all ever reached out to like like a killer mike or like someone like that that they already changing like atlanta because I, I feel like when you think about black culture atlanta is like one of the meccas you know what i'm saying like that's where all the black people is and you do have those people that are changing in their cities uh and i feel like that'll be dope if y'all able to reach out to somebody that can give y'all you know, if they give you a little blueprint or any kind of structure, even though Nashville is totally different than any place I've ever been to. And that's that's 100 percent. We've been everywhere. I've been to Florida, Virginia, you know, Atlanta, Texas. Nashville is its own place. But, you know, at least talking to somebody that can kind of give you they might be able to give you that uh, like some kind of things like, hey, this is where we started. This is where we had success. at. Yeah. And I'm and I'm going to answer in reverse. So, like, I'm an organizer. So anybody that's trying to link up and have a conversation about how we can change the material conditions of black folks in Nashville and even in the South, I always reach out to the Black Nashville Assembly because since we are organizers, we talk to any and everybody. Um, also, if you so move, you also can donate to us uh, via our website, but we're always down to have a conversation with anybody and everybody who love black folks, right? Uh, which is, I think that's important. And then other the other piece is, talking we've talked to judges and i and i want to mention uh one of one of our um founders erica perry who is a movement attorney um worked for uh lawyers for black lives for a really long time did national training on invest divest um she <laughs> does a lot of engagement with the law um and and i'm an organizer so we've had conversations with people who are running for judge right and i think it's one thing to remember and one thing i think we're going to have struggle over as community members is why it's so much of our lives governed and dictated by what happens in the courtroom and i think that's one thing that we're just going to have to struggle with so we've had conversations with several judges several judge candidates and it's always been to drive them to the forum so that we can have a collective conversation with them as a community right because too many times do we have and i didn't experience this myself too many times do we have like advocates who are speaking on our behalf or elected officials who are look kind of like us right or look just like us they'll say one thing for in front of us and i think malcolm may called it talking that talk they'll come talking that talk to us but when but when they're behind closed doors their behavior and that activity looks completely different right and so like even when it comes to like communicating with judges or elected officials we want to do that as a body as a community right because if we want to be able to also hold them accountable oh, as the community because people want to be held accountable they ain't nobody going to do that you see what i'm saying and that's a problem if we if we have nashville city budget is two billion dollars if if 
if you can't be held accountable for making bad budget decisions, then who's at, we are not in control of our own tax dollars. You see what I'm saying? Which is why Nashville ends up looking the way that it ends up looking. That's how we end up with like um, a district, like a, a Brandon Taylor that represents North Nashville. But if you look at their campaign contributions, they're getting money from all kinds of developers and real estate agents. So no wonder our, our communities will be rezoned in a way where we can't afford to live here no more. You see what I'm saying? So the problem is that we even have in Nashville, even with our local elected officials, is that there's no body of black folks that are holding them accountable. And the black folks who pretend, who talk that talk, who pretend to hold them accountable are just usually the ones who are able to benefit from it the most, right? We can't buy our way out of this. The only thing that we can do is we can organize together to change our material conditions because it's going to take all of us. So I did want um some people I did want everybody to get to know their black assembly member Jamel. So so it wasn't just you know fight the fight fire. So I want everybody to know a little bit about you. So we wanted to let everybody know you did say you were from North Nashville. Uh, yeah. Let everybody know you did say you go to uh, Eastlet, uh, yeah. Nat, but we want to know uh, some personal things about you. Favorite type of movie, favorite type of food. If you're a sports fan, favorite sport, favorite team, best memory um just so everybody get a little bit personal feel if you got a favorite movie what's your favorite family. movie if you're a family oriented man or so go from there so everybody yep. get a little gist from you go ahead yeah so uh most of my family from north nashville so uh gooches campbell's stories they probably it's probably what i'm listening to this right now we probably related you know what i'm saying okay. if you know a gooch we probably related yeah. type of thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, we probably related. Uh, so that's always like a beautiful thing to be able to walk around Nashville and always be like one person away. I think my favorite movie, though, and this might be a crazy hot take, was the first Matrix. You know what I'm saying? I could turn that on anytime. That's a good choice. And and I remember when I found out that uh, it was actually written by a black woman and Neo was supposed to be a black man. That just like changed the whole. The oh, yeah, whole Will thing. Smith. Yeah, yeah Will Smith. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the original woman who wrote it literally said that this is supposed to be a black black person. Um, so I think that's fire. Uh, my favorite sport is always gonna be basketball. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Easy day. Yeah, you can't go you can't go wrong with the hoopers. What you think? My favorite. I grew up. I grew up. I saw the tail end of Michael Michael Jordan, and I told the little homie the other day. I'm like, if you see the tail end of Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can really choose anybody else you know what i'm saying uh so chicago has always been my favorite team and i think chicago is playing really good basketball right now they're really fun to watch them and yeah. um them in new orleans okay not right yeah. now new orleans kind of poo right now but okay so yeah new orleans was cool to watch at the beginning when everybody was healthy yeah so it's safe to say you're a sneakerhead oh yeah uh, yeah so i worked uh i worked 10 years uh for foot lock that's my first job Which foot Locker? Your... rivergate I worked at Kids Foot Locker for a long time. Yeah, bro. I, I worked. At, uh, I worked with Jermaine. I worked at uh, Hickory Hollow for fucking ten years. Yeah, I worked. I, with Mar I worked with Marlo. Uh, Stop. I think her name was Starlight over at Foot Locker. Yeah, I know you talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I had yeah. Jermaine, Nicole. I had all of them. Like I was there forever. Yeah. And I was just you know Justine that was over all of the city gears. I was cool with Justine. Yeah. I remember that whole little crew. Oh What's man. That What's your top three? Uh, what's your top three on the number line? That's it. That's interesting. So I so uh, I I, I want to say like the prime time to be a sneakerhead, and I don't care about no other decade anybody else was living was the recession. You could okay. get anything and everything you wanted. <laughs> and, and Foot Locker had like we used to have these employee fifty percent offs. Oh yeah. my god! <laughs> and we had no cards. Remember before they had the cards? Yes. Before you can get everything on discount. As long as you had cash, it was all hey, busting down, I, bro. It was okay, bro. I got you. I got you. Mm -hmm. And I remember, shoot, the, the boxes. Remember, the, they had the boxes that had like the, the 11s and the 12s. They had like the sneaker boxes. They weren't even selling. Like, shoes weren't even selling. They was all in the back. You can get whatever. Bro, you remember the, uh, and, and I came up on a couple pair during that time. So, like, the old love, new love ones. That's mm -hmm. my favorite. That's my favorite uh, defining moment pack. Um, they had another time when the raging bulls and then the all oh my black God, yes. came yes. in the same box. Yeah. So them two, I just bought, I, I just bought them. I just bought them again because I bought the, I bought mine. 
I bought I got- mine for four ninety five from Flight Club. Then my roommate that I stayed with stole my all red ones, so I had to keep them uh all five ones. Still mad, so I had to. I just bought them like a couple months ago, and they restocked them again. I ain't even took them out the box yet. But go ahead, go ahead. And, and, and I'm gonna tell you the crazy thing is, I didn't even buy them on the day they released. They no, was really? just, they were just there, and so I was yeah, like, let me go and get these. <laughs> them fives was go forever, you know what I'm saying? And, but I I will say this: the shoe that I hate the most. This I hate this and I hate this shoe and I don't even want to bring it up, but I hate this shoe. Tim, no, them no, Jordan seven. nines. Nines. I'm the only nigga that like nines. I, they look like a cleat. It looks like a cleat, bro. I hate I'm sevens and tens. I hate sevens and tens. Thirteens is my favorite. Them yeah, fours, fours, the uh, fours, thirteens, and um, elevens. It's my favorite. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you a shoe that most people ain't never put their foot in. That was probably still the most comfortable shoe I ever wore. If you remember the 17s when they mm-hmm. came out, they had that glove, like mm-hmm. the low, not the wreck, not the ones that came in the suitcase. I'm talking about the lows that you put this fucking glove in. Oh my, them shoes! I don't know what it was, but them shoes like they were comfortable as hell. <laughs> uh, then, uh, I, and I know, and I know you, I know y'all probably, I know y'all probably been a part of the like crazy shoe launches um i don't mm-hmm. know if y'all remember but them concord pan leather jumps the 11 dropped was it like was it 2011 like, oh my god yo you talking about rivergate yes yes i was there i was outside like so i tell you the funniest story because i saw somebody so, get their ass whooped over that because actually i had somebody get it for me and i was sitting outside and so what happened was I actually told him to get it the day before. So I went there the day before and then I had already had it in the car. And then he was like, I forgot to get mine. So then we was going back to go get it. So then I'm sitting in the car. And then next thing I know, it was like we well, coming back out and then he had already got it. So we sit in the car and he was like, Yeah, look, let's go. Let me go ahead and text this person go through. So we sitting there waiting. And then he's like, I know your bitch ass heard me sit there and say that's mine. So then I look over and I'm just like, Man, I bet you they fighting over them shoes. And then, and then next thing I was like, I know you ain't. And then I just hear, so I was, you would have thought he hit him with a brick. Next thing I know, you remember when that story, when they said that one dude got killed by like five people over them. Okay. That was something, something he ain't died, but man, I'm talking about, uh, what's that one boondocks? He was like, them people jumped him. He's like, I wonder, mm-hmm. he's like, I wonder what he did. Yes. They whooped his ass mm-hmm. over one. It's, it's two times I seen somebody get their ass whooped. It was when. This one dude came out of Popeyes with four bags of the chicken sandwiches laughing, and everybody was in line mad when they sold out. And when that dude uh sold out of them uh concourse, he got his ass whooped. No, ass bro. Whooped. Like, like I'm saying, when, when the day that you're talking about when those when that released in Rivergate, bro, we got there because I caught I, like I said, I knew the people that worked at Rivergate. I called them, I was like, Hey, bro, we ain't got them down here in, in Hickory Hollow. What's good? And it was like, Hey, come over early. First of all, people was camping outside the whole night. They, they was camping outside the whole night, and Rivergate said, we're going to open up. I think it was like 7. It was like, we're going to open up at 7. It was so bad. They had the outside was taped up. They had to tape all the way around the parking lot. Where you couldn't park in the parking lot, you had to park in Target. So we parked in Target, and then so I'll never forget this. Like, I'm walking down, and then you see, like, everybody kind of inching. Everybody inching towards, inching towards, inching towards. And then I was like, bro, I was like, bro, we got to go. We got to take a break for it. And then my boy was like, all right, bro, that's just sleep easy. And we took off running and we took off running. Everybody was like, ah! and everybody started running down. I was like, bro, what the fuck is going on? So we get, and we like get the door and shit. And then finally they let us in and then they pulled us in and we went through to uh, City Gear. And we was like the first in line. Motherfuckers was banging on the fence and shit. And then dude was like, hey, who was the first people here? And I was like, bro, me and this nigga was the first people here. And then he was like, all right, y'all two come in. And they only still had like 12 shoes. That's it was like, say. yeah, they had a shoe. They only had 12 shoes. Cause, cause you know, the shoe game was corrupt at that time. So, you know what I'm saying? Like most of the time, all the shoes are already gone anyway in the store. You know what I'm saying? Like, so. It was, I ain't never seen no shit like that, bro. That 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 Concord release, I don't know what they did, but whatever they did, they caused. Ma- Look, I was so I was so I was working at a uh, kid Foot Locker at the time, and I got there like I, I had I had somebody from the Foot Locker hit my line. It was like, yo, it's already a line out here. It was like three in the morning. 
Yeah. I don't know what they was doing there, but they called me. It was like, yo, it's a line in front of your store already. So I hit my manager. His name was Marlo Whoop de Whoop. And we came through around like, I think we got there like 4 30. You did like, the store was across from Victoria's Secret at the time. Yep. It's not yep. where the, the kids for like is now. And so in that little that little pocket in front of Journeys, it was just a sea of people. No line. Security wasn't around. It was well, just you, a- you could get in the mall prior because you had the people that will walk. You had the old people that would walk around yeah. the mall. So you remember Hicker Hollow and, and River Gave, you didn't know unless you was a shoehead, you could get in that bitch at like five in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Three in the morning, you could walk in that bitch and just be standing at the door, you know what I'm saying, posted up. And so Yeah, and my and my uncle was one of them walkers. He walked at Rivergate. Uh God bless his soul. But he was one of them walkers over at Rivergate. So when I'm on my way, he called me too, like, hey son, I don't know what y'all got going on. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> So look, so I pull up. I'm first before Marlo. So I hit the corner, and when I hit the corner, I see so many people. I take my I take my stripes off because I'm like, if they oh, see, you don't want that problem. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want the problem. I'm like, if they see a foot like a person walking up, it's gonna be crazy. Look, and this probably like why I'm so comfortable in front of crowds right now because that crowd was, I don't know how long they had been there, but they looked like they was ready to go. So look. You know the benches over there. So I so I get into the crowd. I stand up on the bench. Somebody recognizes me from the store because you know you work there. Yeah, everybody People, know you. Everybody know me, right? So I get up there. I start talking and explaining. Like we probably had like we probably had like a hundred grade school sizes. Uh, probably like fifty preschool sizes. Probably like fifty infant sizes. So I'm telling everybody what sizes we got, and I'm like, look. We probably got enough for everybody over here because we the only kids for locker in this district. So yes. we, we got a whole lot of shoes. But I'm like, but y'all gonna have, have one yet. No. And I'm like, y'all gonna have to get in line. <laughs> and so we got them in line. Cause these kids' shoes, these ain't grown men. So these women and kids. We got them in line, open up the gate. They stayed outside the gate. We had to write, we took a slip of paper and write down every size. And we limited to everybody to get one grade school, one preschool, one infant. And I ain't never seen black <laughs> folks work together <laughs> to try to figure out who got what sizes so everybody could get one. We sold out in like, when we finally opened the store, we sold out in like 15 minutes. Completely yeah. sold out. Like that T-shirts shit. and all. Like that shit used to be crazy. Like I just, like I don't, people, I don't think people understand how the shoe game in Nashville was. Like it was just wild, bro. Wow. Like, and it would be every shoe, like every release shoe that would come out. You know, like you said, when we first, when I first started working there, though, like you would have shoes that they wouldn't sell out, and then it was like all of a sudden, I want to say like maybe two thousand and uh, like twelve or eleven or something like that. That shit just hit like everything that came. I'm talking about you. You got uh, the Dion's will come out. Them motherfuckers will sell out. You know what I'm saying? Like the 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 answers will come out. The fucking oh, eyes bitches will sell out. You know the crazy eights came out. They sold out. Like yeah. I was like, bro, this. I was like, this phone poses. Mm. Yeah, phone poses crazy. Oh. Phone, I w- forces. That's what crazy forces will sell out. Like like custom forces. Like certain color forces. Them bitches will sell out. Yeah, I, I went through a phone posit kick, and I I think it was a terrible idea. I love the shoe. I love the shoe for the time I was going through oh, it. Yeah. Man, I got five. I got five phone posits. Mm. I got the black ones. I got, I, you know, I, I graduated from TSU, so I got the gray and blue ones. I got the black and blue ones. I got a black and green pair, and I got a fatigue pair. Man, oh, I, I, got I, got two I got two phone I got the all red ones that came out, and I got the going fishings. Because mm. the going they only had to go on fishes in like two stores, mm-hmm. and I, I, I got to go on fishes because they, because they was green. I, I just liked them. I forgot I had those shoes until just now. I don't know where them bitches at. <laughs> about, I got about four of them. I think then they started getting like stupid, ridiculous, like hard as fuck to get. I think I got the moss. I got the green ones. I got a uh, the um the and my memory is terrible today. Uh, I got the orange ones that come that match the San Francisco uh, color ones. I got mm. the pink ones. Don't ask me why I bought them, but them things with them pearl. Oh, I got them too. Oh, I got them too. I got because uh, I got them KD five Aunt pearls, the KD fours. Mm. I got um um 
I, I was trying so hard to get them. I ended up finding them cough drops. You got uh, them brotherhoods. Man, nobody care about them. I got them uh I got them uh KD. I mean I got them um the cough drops. I found them for steel. And then I still oh, I got the uh Royal Blues. I got mm. them off StockX. I got them off StockX for a hundred and forty dollars. Right? Mm. This is before StockX started taxing. I was taxing like, out the ass. No, StockX, this one, StockX was giving a free authentication and they was only charging you $5 for tax. So, below, I guess get my last two. My last two, I got, I got you for your top three. Well, last three. Your top three rappers, top three albums, and your top three places to eat in the bill. Okay. Uh, so, so when it comes to my top three albums, I'm going to go... Uh, I'm a, I'm just gonna be egregious because I want to be. Uh, you can choose any one of the dedications. I think after dedication, like five, it starts getting a little reckless, though. Okay. Um, two, my favorite. I can go with that one. Dedication two. Um, gotta put some R&B in there, so I'm gonna do like Frank Ocean, Channel Orange. Okay, I can I can fuck with that. And then my third one is uh, oh my oh we. The third one hard because I want to go with a like a J Cole record, or you know just be on my hip hop shit and go like Jay Z hard knock. Um, I thought you would have put a Jeezy honestly. One on one. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real to you. One on three is really slept on. That it I don't is. know. That's one on three is I can start one on three start to finish, but that's this is me. That's just me interjecting. But okay, <laughs> top top three records. So for I mean, my top three rappers, my fault. So for my top three rapper, rappers, I'm just gonna make it a point to go all south because okay. I'm from the south. You know what I'm saying? So anybody not from the south is gonna be automatically ruled out of this. Okay. So I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go. Little Wayne. Easy. Always. Oh, Andre three thousand. Stacks. And then Pimp C. Mm. Okay. And then if we, right. and if we then if we was gonna go to top five. I would put an honorable mention on Big Crit. Oh Easy. God. That Big Crit is in my top three. So I'm saying, and then <laughs> I would have to, and for the homie's sake, I would put my homie Mike Floss on there, cause okay, okay, Mike, okay, because he gonna say he the greatest rapper alive, and I don't heard him. <laughs> you know what I'm okay. saying? I'm gonna ask him his if he don't do the die line method, Mike, 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 uh, he 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 can't go. You might okay. have to give him permission to do that though. I ain't gonna okay, lie. I'm I'm gonna ask him. I'm gonna say, okay, so first off, we are gonna give you top ten. So the first five better be him, and then the back ten, I'm gonna let him do that one. Okay, so then the top three places in, in the Ville to eat. So first, uh, I'm gonna choose uh, my mama's house because okay. uh, you know what I'm saying we from the south. Mama's Easy. beginning down. Uh, two, I'm gonna throw the homies in there, Slim and Huskies. Hey. You can't go wrong with one of them pieces. I need y'all to answer my DMs to come on the show, Slim and Huskies. Hey, hey, clean them hard to get to. <laughs> um, and then third. Man, I don't really know. It would have been like it would have been like Bolton's or Princess Hot Chicken or somewhere like and they just hard to get to sometimes, bro. I'm, I'm, gonna, gonna, tell, I'm gonna tell you a place that motherfuckers sleep on that ain't went to out of Antioch is a place called Bones. Oh, I heard that place fire, bro. Oh my god, Bones got the best catfish sandwich that you can motherfucking eat, boy. Bones is fire, but it's a little it the, the motherfucker is a little like drive up, you know what I'm saying? It's like they open the window, like hey, what you need? Like it ain't no building, no shit like that. No, nah, the, 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 the other place I was gonna include because I got to for my brother listen to this and bite my head off. Germantown pub. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my brother just my brother is the chef over there. He redid the menu and that and that motherfucker go hard. Okay. I was gonna say my, my dog who uh vehicle city Coney Darius, my my dog food truck. So you know everybody support they they peoples, but okay, so everybody got their phone, but Slim Huskies uh is up there top three everybody top three for that one but uh crazy that Slim Husky just took over like because i was like i came to the villa out of nowhere it was like bro why everybody keep talking about this place and i was like oh my god this shit is good as hell like this shit is good. <laughs> I, I was just like everybody talking bro like i, I love pizza everybody just talking and then mike mike on. killed that show there too mike killed that show there yeah that's why i seen that unplugged shit. but yeah he, he definitely killed that one but Go ahead and uh Jamel, uh go ahead and tell everybody how to get in touch with you and how to get in touch with the Black Nashville Assembly and how to register if they want to be at the next uh mass meetings. Got it right that time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh <laughs> you can if you want to keep up with me, uh have, like any questions or organizing that you want to do, 
you can always hit me up directly via my social media. It's Nashville Red on all social media. If you want to ever tap in with the Black Nashville Assembly, you can follow us on all social media at BLKNSH Assembly. If you ever want to sign up for any of our events or donate to us, you can go to blacknashvilleassembly.org, all spelled out, and um, check us out. If you want to register for our candidate form, um, you can go to blacknashvilleassembly.org slash forum, um, and you will be able to, to, to uh, register. And when you register, you get on our text list. And when you get on our text list, we are, we are in constant contact with you, and we let you know exactly when and where our stuff is coming up. So, yeah, you can tap in with any of us on all of those platforms, and feel free to send us anything if you know an event where black folks about to be getting together we'd love to be able to pull up talk to some folks get them politically engaged and keep moving forward and y'all don't have to worry about if y'all do forget something because i'm going to post them like i always do on our stories on our podcast page on the 8m292 underscore podcast page and make sure y'all follow them and don't worry i'm going to post them like i said again josh go ahead and hit us with your scriptures of everything that you're doing all right, so right now, you know, as you guys know, I'm finna deploy. So I'm trying to get everything out. Uh, I've been making everything. We got shirt. I got all my shirts. Uh, everything been going on. You got skincare. We had a skin event that just happened la- uh, yesterday, which was fucking dope as fuck. Um, and so, and then I also um, been doing a lot of the woodwork and anything. So anything you need, anything custom, anything crafts, you know, or skincare, I got you. I got all my crystal. My crystal business, I've been selling out like shit. I got like 10 orders to do right now. So uh, everybody kind of supporting right now just because they know I'm going to deploy and I'm going to be gone. So I'm not going to be able to make everything. So if you need anything, you already know uh, the Najee experience uh, on uh, Instagram and then on TikTok. Hey, my TikTok is blowing up. It's Najee, Najee, Najee. We're at 92,000 right now. All right, and y'all make sure y'all go ahead and check out the Eight More Than Ninety Two podcast merch, which you can check on our Shopify, which is in the link on our bio. I'm not about to say it because I've fucked up enough other stuff on this episode already, which I won't know because I'm edited it all out. But make sure y'all follow the page at the Eight M Two Ninety Two. See, follow the podcast page, or you can email us at the Eight More Than Ninety Two podcast at gmail.com. This has been another episode of the 8 Morning 92 podcast. Make sure y'all follow Jamel and the Black National Assembly. We will holler at y'all later. Peace. Black people to have housing, education, health care, transportation, green environments, and safety that is free from the anti-black prison industrial complex. We're creating this reality by building a bold political agenda through grassroots democracy, meaning we're surveying our people, holding listening sessions and assemblies and more. Our fight to build a city for us is done through collective decision making and community organizing. We are building black political power to meet our current needs while disrupting and dismantling systems that fail our communities. We are the bringers of our own liberation, and that liberation is achieved through acquiring power. So back in this bitch, uh, no, we full attack in this shit, uh, you know the full Mac came equipped, uh, so promise you don't want no.